All right, welcome back. So in the last video, we took a look at um, a VDAR Archives uh, packed um, binary, and we started to do some initial assessment to determine um, sort of the next steps. How, how are we going to unpack this? Um, go back to that sample in Ida Pro. Uh, something that we want to you know, keep in mind here as we go into this analysis is that not only do we have a write process memory, right? And, and I said this is probably a good point for our debugging session to pick up because now we can actually start to inspect where and how this is writing to the process memory, what's being written there. Um, but if we go just a little bit further, there is something that will you know, complicate our analysis maybe just a tad. So you'll notice Ida has this flow arrow that loops around, which means that this is actually um, a, a looping structure here. And that means that this function is going to be called a number of times. If we navigate into this, you'll see that there is also a call to write process memory here. So that means that um, if we are trying to understand, you know, sometimes the unpacking process, it will unpack an executable and the whole thing will just be copied at kind of one fell swoop into this, this new region of memory where it intends to execute it. In this case, in the context of this process that it appears to be hollowing out. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and one thing you can look for, um, especially if you're you know, already very suspicious of process hollowing, when the call to create process takes place, this argument of, of four for the creation flags that tells the process to be created in a suspended state. That means that it's it takes the executable that the process was created with, it loads it into memory, the operating system loads it into memory, maps all the sections, all that, but then it doesn't begin execution. So it stays suspended, which allows, in this case, our malware authors to go ahead and swap out the code, the original code from the executable, whatever it was, with whatever code it wants. So we have at least one call to write process memory, and then we have you know a, an undetermined amount based off of this this looping structure. Okay, so the goal here is to use WinDebug and in particular time travel debugging in order to perform the rest of this analysis. So with WinDebug, um, everybody has their favorite debugger. There's X32, X64 debug. That's probably one of the you know, most popular debuggers now, certainly seen as a very a very strong successor to Ali debug. Ali debug probably pretty old is pretty old at this point. I don't think it's maintained anymore and hasn't been for quite some time. I guess I haven't looked in quite some time, but I haven't used it in years. Um, you have WinDebug, and WinDebug, I, I, a lot of people complain about it. It's not the most intuitive or obvious, right? So if, if I had to suggest a debugger, because you've never done any debugging to start with, I would say, yeah, you probably grab X32 or X64. And you can find those um, online. Uh, I think there's the GitHub and everything. So very powerful, very feature rich, very user friendly in terms of you know, as far as debuggers go. Now, WinDebug is kind of like my recommendation with learning assembly in that it just forces you to get a little bit more kind of, I don't know, intimate with your debugger. Um, it's not the cleanest experience, but it still does all of basically the same debugging that you're going to get from X32, X64. And the reason that I learned it in the first place is because I was learning some kernel debugging, right? And, and WinDebug supports kernel debugging on Windows. We're not doing that here, but just to set the stage a little bit better. Now, WinDebug has a couple of different versions. The version that we're going to use is called WinDebug Preview, which you, for better or for worse, you have to install through the Microsoft App Store. So I've already done that. Now, when we launch WinDebug Preview, the UI is going to look a little bit cleaner than the other version of WinDebug that you get through the debugging tools if you go and download it there. But the most important thing is that when we go to File, we get time travel debugging, which the other version of WinDebug does not support. Okay, so that's what we want to do here. Launch executable, pick the path to our executable. So I have this on the desktop. This needs no arguments. I don't care about the start directory. We don't really need to worry about debugging child processes, but I usually check that just in case, especially if I'm not sure 100% what's going to happen. In this case, we are starting a hollowed process, we don't necessarily need to debug that process because 
we're going to stop during the activity in the original executable that's writing to that process. But let's say we wanted to debug. Well, we might need to check that box. And then most importantly, if we want to, to utilize time travel debugging, we need to check the record with t uh, time travel debugging or TTD. Okay, after that, click configure. This will tell TTD where to or when debug where to drop the files. And now it's executing, right? So it's running the executable and going for a Let's see here. Um, for a little while, as it's creating the trace files. Now, one thing that never hurts to just take a look at is your process activity. You can see that it did, in fact, launch itself after that debug session. So I'm going to terminate that because I don't need the malware actually running while I'm analyzing it. And that's always a challenge when you move into this dynamic analysis phase. You want to have you know proper analysis environment. You want to make sure you're isolated. You want to make sure that you're prepared for if that malware, when it runs, that it kind of you, that you lose control of it, and that it can't then damage um, you know anything in your environment unintentionally. Okay, so where does that leave us with this session? Well, what's happened then is it it recorded the execution until the process terminated. So in this case, we got a relatively short trace but we got all of the activity that we needed in order to perform our analysis. Now, TTD is something that you'll find it can be a little bit slower. The trace files can get large, especially if it's recording a lot of activity. Um, and there's gonna be plenty of nuances. This is something that I admittedly don't have a ton of experience with quite yet, but I do find that almost everything I've analyzed in the last few months anyway, um, I go ahead and I get a trace with TTD and I do my analysis here unless I have to move to a regular debugger. And you'll see in a moment, I think one of the, the most useful features that, that I get out of it is that I have the, you have the ability to go back and forth in the execution in this trace file. So if I'm doing traditional debugging, if I say, a break, set, let's say, I say a set a breakpoint and it's not actually in the path of execution, or let's say I actually accidentally step too far, well, if I need to get my, my debug session back to that point that I missed, I've got to restart the whole thing, which sometimes, especially if I'm really deep into unraveling something, can be quite time consuming and tedious. With um, TTD, we can go back and forwards really, really easily. Okay, so a few things about the UI. Um, you have your views, which allow you to open up any of the different views. Um, I've already set up the layout here. So you'll notice that if you're using it for the first time, um, the default is to just have the, you know, the command window here and I think these, these timelines down below. So you can select the views that you want and then you can kind of drag them here. A little bit easier than I think WinDebug, normal WinDebug, uh, just because it, it provides that ability to you know, uh, very clearly see where you're going to dock that view to. What views I have right now, uh, disassembly. I have the registers because I wanna see the user registers. And of course we want that to be large enough to see those values. Um, we have the command window. I have the command window down below. And it's a little crowded here just because of, the, again, the font size. So this isn't my normal layout, but it's going to get um, everything that we need. Uh, we have the different threads. Sometimes you'll have multi-threaded applications and this will allow you to switch back and forth between those thread contexts. Um, and then you have this timeline. This is something that's very unique to TTD. So by default, it lays out a timeline for exceptions. Well, we didn't have any exceptions, so I'm just gonna delete that. And now you can add a timeline and you can pick what you want this timeline to, to focus on. So let's say function calls and let's pick a function. So kernel 32 exclamation um, write process memory. So this is the syntax with WinDebug. You have the library, exclamation, and then the API. The nice thing about this is you can wildcard. So let's say I just wanted to look for, you know, anything that had write process in it. Or let's say I wanted to look for anything that had process in it, right? Those wildcards do in fact work. Um, in this case though, I have an API that I'm, I am interested in and I can define that here. Um, now, what's going to happen is you're gonna get these little tabs in your timeline. So usually I'm only interested in where it's being called. So I'm gonna uncheck the end location 
leave start location and now we'll add okay and then once you apply the um the, the filter then you'll see little arrows here to indicate that there is a result so this um the dark blue arrow here large arrow indicates where we're at we're at the beginning of the execution timeline and if we want to zoom in i admit it, I feel it's a little clunky but um, it allows us to zoom in and we can start to see these these individual allocations or these individual um, api calls in this case and what that allows us to do is we can select any of those and that takes us then to that location now you might think okay here's a call to write process memory and that's great and all but i want to see where it was called not at the library level but from the actual code well now if you go to to the home tab you'll have your forward regular debugger commands and you'll have your backwards debugger commands so all of the backwards stepping debug commands are the same as their forward stepping equivalent except they take you in the opposite direction so this is i think really cool and that i can now step over back and you can see now we're at the location in the binary where it was originally called okay how do we know that well i'll do a cls to clear the screen lm is to list the modules that are loaded so here we have our binary it's loaded at an address of 210000 right so not the default image base of 400,000 hex it's using or opted into ASLR so it got a random ish base which means that if we want to find this let's say in IDA what we have to do is we have to subtract from the current instruction the image base All right well this one's kind of easy because 210000 Right, if we subtract that from 211352, we just get left with 1352. That means that if we add that to the default image base of 400,000 hex, we get 401352. So we should be able to go into IDA and go to 401352. And there's our call to write process memory. Right, and just to kind of double confirm, we can follow the cross references back real quickly. There's that function call, right? And we're back into this, this logic of the, um, you know, the, the process howling occurring. Now, you'll notice that this call comes outside of that loop. Well, I'm gonna move this timeline over and this is, this is an area where I think other debuggers maybe are a little bit stronger, although I suppose we could do a, let's see, a memory view, and we could look at ESP, that's our stack pointer, and in the normal version of, oops, in the normal version of um, Windabug, we can, we can tell it how to display this data. So I would, I would set it to D words because that's the size um, of our stack. Uh, we've got a stack window. Yeah, that's not going to necessarily help. So um, anyways, there's probably a window. I guess my point is there's probably a window that can help with this, but I usually just type in the command uh, ddesp. And what that does is it provides, um, it takes point, you know, the pointer esp and it reads d words four byte values at a time and just displays them here. So here you can see there's, you know, the arguments for write process memory. That's the handle to our process. That's the location of memory to write to. This is the buffer to write from, and this is the size. So that, that call that we're investigating right here, well, this comes, you know, after this loop, and it's only a four-byte value. So I'm not 100% sure what it is, and I didn't, even for this demo, I didn't take the time to investigate it. So let's continue to, to back up a little bit. Um, let's zoom in a bit more. Let's go to the first call. Hopefully I can get there. Doesn't really feel like I'm at that one. So we'll step over back. And let's see, 2166E. So 40166E. And that is, in fact, the first call before we enter this loop here. 
right? Even though that line kind of, th it always throws me off just a little bit in terms of the timeline. Okay, um, and again, because I have the font large and everything, it just makes everything a little bit more crowded. So um, we step backwards. We can now look at the call stack. We can see something that's, that's quite a bit more promising. There's the handle to our process. We just have to assume that that's the handle coming from the, the created process, that hollowed process. We could continue to trace back if we needed to. We could figure that out 100%. Um, but in this case, I'm happy with the, you know, like my assessment of this is likely what it is. Now, this is going to write 400,000 hex into that process. That's the default image base. That's also a good sign. Um, and then that is the a pointer to our buffer. So if we db, um, and there's a there's a number of d commands, db, dw, dd, dq, for byte, word, d word, quad word, we can look at that data, c38e20, and what we see is evidence of a PE file. So that's a good indication. The only kind of catch here is that it's only for 400 bytes, 400 hex bytes. So, you know, do the math there. Um, that's That typically would indicate to me, and I don't think I have a great PE file to show that 100%, but if we open up a hex editor and just grab one of these PE files that we're looking at, let's grab the original, this original sample, um, what you'll notice is that you know, oh, well, this actually is a pretty good one. Uh, at 400, uh, 400 hex byte, you know, four, this would be 400 hex offset. That's where the section, this first section begins. And then all of this content before that is all header information. So if that's really the case, then likely what's happening here is that we have a call to write the header. Then we have a call here and the reason that there it's in a loop and there is another call, you know right process is because now that's writing all of the different sections and then this last call is doing something probably to affect how that hollow process is going to execute um, but i don't know that without digging into you know this logic a little bit more maybe even the next stage code to see where if you know it because we know where it's going to write the address that we're going to it's going to write to in that hollow process we could try to trace cross references to that location and and stuff but I, I don't we don't need to do that for for this particular um for this particular challenge okay so that means that now if we well let's investigate if we investigate any of these right process memory we'll step over back and we'll do a DDESP. You'll see, okay, we're getting to different sections of that process. We're using different parts of the buffer, and they're going to have different sizes. Okay, so how do we how do we extract this? Um, well, I, there's a number of ways, I'm sure. Many of you are probably thinking of, of a number of different approaches. Um, but the way that uh, that I came up with is that we, we know that we have our original... The, you know, the beginning of our PE file at this location, C38E20, as you can see here. Um, if we look at, this is the second to last. This is the last call to virtual alloc inside of that loop. We know that that last call just writes a four byte value somewhere in a very high, uh, you know, high address range. It probably has nothing to do with the actual PE file. So we can see that this is the last address of the buffer, and then this is the size. So, Let's get the calculator out. Um, you can see I moved our calculator to programmer mode. And uh, let me clear this. We have our original value, C3, um, C3, 8, 3, E20. Uh, we subtract the current. Well, actually, I just did that backwards. So let's do uh, C7, D020. So that's the current buffer. Oh, oh. Man, uh, let's try that again. Uh, so C7D020 minus the original buffer. So that's the total kind of offset, the number of bytes from the beginning to the current location, plus 4C00, that's 48E00. So that's the total number of bytes that have been written based off of those calls to write process memory 
from the header through those different sections. So we know the address, the base address. Let's copy that. Um, now what we can do is a quick way to do this with Windabug is just to use the dot write mem command, provided a location. So we'll call this uh, stage one vdar dot bin because we, we don't know. We don't know what's going to come out of this next stage. Is it just copying itself? Is it another round of packing unpacking that has to take place? We don't know yet. We have the address. So I'm going to fill that in in just a moment. And then we have the value that we calculated. So uh, that was shoot, I already forgot it. Um, well, let's do this. I'm going to copy that and then I'll go back in my 38E20. All right. 38E20. Okay, so what we're telling what we're telling Windabug to do is at this address, copy that number of bytes. The L just tells it to, 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 to treat that not as a ending address and this not as a range, but that this as a length or a size. So start here, copy those number of bytes. And oh, what did I do wrong? C38 E20. Oops, go the other direction. And that's what happens if you give it an invalid address. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I just simply forgot in the short period of time that I looked at the value and tried to write it or, or type it in. So, um, you know, if you get a if you get an unable to read memory, that does happen. Uh, you got to check: Did you provide a good start address? Is this a valid length? Or if you're doing an address range, is it a valid end address? And um, and if not, you know, double check your memory layout. So let's give that a try. What you can see now is that it wrote 48E00 bytes. So it looks like it did in fact work. Well, let's check it out. All right. So stage one VDAR. Uh, let's put it in Detected Easy, right? One of the first things that I want to validate is that a tool that is designed to parse PE files can actually parse this PE file. So far, so good. Let's look at the strings, and in particular, t.me. I know that was a URL that we saw in the last video, well, probably two videos ago now, that was part of the configuration extraction, right? And now we can see it. So that's a really good sign. That means that we've more than likely extracted the right size of the image. Um, you'll see the size of image, 5F000. And hmm, that's a little different than the number of bytes that we told it to extract. So we could go back now and we could adjust our extraction, 5F000. And let's just call this fixed. File is incomplete. Hmm, okay. Well, that's fine. Um, unable to read memory somewhere. So likely what that means is that this offset, this size, is longer than the regions of, of valid memory. And so it just couldn't read beyond that because there wasn't any memory allocated there. Now, it's kind of interesting when we think about this is that um, this is coming from the original buffer that this PE file emerged from. Let's add a new timeline here. And we'll look for kernel 32 um, virtual alloc. Okay, and just the start location. You can see, oh, we have one allocation right before those calls. Actually, you know what? Let's let's amend that and let's let's look for virtual alloc ex. Okay, one call. Virtual alloc. The difference between the two. Virtual alloc allocates memory in the current process. Virtual alloc ex takes as its first argument a handle to another process. So if we follow that call, step over back. Let's clear this and look at the call stack. You'll see there's our handle of our suspended process, there's the base of that image, and there's the size, 5F0000. So that does line up with what we're seeing there, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily affect the fact that we extracted this PE file successfully, because the, the buffers that are being used, the memory that's being used to copy it into this target process 
it, it obviously doesn't need as large of a size. Okay, what else can we do? Well, it looks like we have successfully extracted that a la Detect It Easy. Um, kind of the two last ultimate tests. Now we've got our fix, so apparently it wrote quite a bit of it, but I'm just gonna stick with this one, is we can drop it into Pro. And there we go. Begin the disassembly process. And what I'm looking for at this point is any errors, right? If there's any problems with the the PE file format, Ida would start. It would probably complain. It would say, "Hey, I can't. I can't understand this section. The section got truncated. There's something wrong here. I can't parse the contents." Certainly, if there were there were major issues, we wouldn't get clean disassembly. That is, we wouldn't get what appears to be, you know, a, a main entry point with all of the logic that hopefully we're, we're we're looking to unravel next. But that seems to be the case here. Um, the other sort of ultimate test is you run it, put it in a debugger and run it, upload it to a sandbox, run it, and if it executes, then I, I'd say we're as good as we need to be, at least for this, this particular stage. Now, the extraction based off of the expected size and the actual size might affect the hash of the file. So that is, I mean, we, we will probably affect the hash of the file. So we do want to keep that in mind, but if all we're interested in right now is looking at this unpacked sample, well, we've, you know, we've done it. And now we can do things like, you know, double confirm with the strings, because as we scroll through these, we're going to see, you know, not that just because we've unpacked something, we're always gonna see the strings, but we're gonna to start to see things like, you know, the botnet and some different URLs. I don't know what that is. That wasn't in, um, that wasn't, wasn't in the triage data that we looked at. Uh, different file system paths, so probably you know different places that it's looked to steal data from. Uh, evidence of HTTP traffic, so network traffic. There's there's you know some different um, you know software that it's stealing from. The the goal here at this point in this video isn't to analyze what this what the stealer is doing, but just to get it unpacked. So we've gotten it there. We've got a pretty clean unpacked um, binary, and now we can take our analysis to the next level. Again, keep in mind, um, the unpacking process, the reason why there's no one-size-fits-all tool out there is because there is so much variation there. Sometimes you will get a clean PE file. Sometimes a PE file like this will appear to not have any additional obfuscation or anti-analysis. Um, a lot of times you will find that there'll be multiple stages of, of unpacking and there will be obfuscation and other anti-analysis tricks at every single level. So. This was a good sample because it introduces the process, um, I think, in one of the most, well, probably one of the more straightforward approaches that there is. Um, this also gave us the opportunity to talk about time travel debugging, right? And as you can see, having the ability, and in this, if you go through the command history, what you're seeing actually is um, the, the link language, L-I-N-Q, I believe, and you can use that to investigate the entire trace file. So there's a lot more that we can do with this, but this was just to give you an idea of how, I think how beneficial time travel debugging can be, because it, again, it allows you to very quickly go back and forth in your executable, and you don't have to constantly go and restart your debug session. For example, if we wanted to look at, let's go to the call to create process A. Okay, 1515, so 401515. All we have to do now, okay, remember our base address is 21. So we can set a breakpoint, 211515. You can do the U command, that'll disassemble at that location. And that, that looks about right, but because we're not, we're not really in a live debug session, even if I get this breakpoint wrong, um, it doesn't really matter, right? Because we're, we're just going backwards and forwards. So normally you would type G to move your execution forward, but now we can do G minus, and that takes our execution backwards, and there is 211515, right? If we kept going, minus, we have no other breakpoint set, so this takes us to the initial loading of the file. So we're, we're kind of back in um, before any of the, the content here in main is being executed. 
But now we just do a G to go or any of the commands up here, go. Uh, and that takes us to, in this case, our breakpoint, right? Now we can look at the call stack. And in particular, let's say we wanted to look at the process, 25F388, right? That's the name of the process, the first argument that was passed um, to the call to create process, uh, create process A. Um, so that's the that's the, the the path of the executable that it's loading, right? So again, it's kind of quick and easy. I didn't have to restart the session. Um, so just scratching the surface on TTD, but I wanted to provide I think a very pragmatic and and practical example of how that can benefit your analysis. Um, anyways, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave comments. I will take a look and answer to the best of my ability. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to not only TTD and WinDebug preview, but then also but again, scratching the surface with the unpacking process um, with our particular malware here. But then also getting an introduction to, you know, starting to talk about unpacking in, you know, a little bit deeper analysis with our, our, our sample here, which was VDAR. All right, stay tuned. Um, we'll likely look at some additional topics from this analysis, maybe do some YAR rule development and or some uh, network detection rules using Suricata. Uh, anyways, if you have any ideas, please feel free, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video.